Hey everyone, today I'm going to talk to you guys about some of the best survival crafting games you can play with friends. And before I even get started, I'm going to go ahead and say Rust is not on this list because that game is for people who are off their psych meds. Turn the game off. Attach a car battery to your balls with clamps. Shock yourself for 10 minutes. Do that four times a day and it's just like playing Rust except you don't spend 10 hours doing it. That sounds about right. So if you're trying to find a survival crafting game to play with your friends, hopefully I can save you a little time here because here's four great options. Now you've probably heard of this game before since it's been around since 2015 and many of you have probably steered clear because like me, you're a big boy and you would never play a corny game about dinosaurs. But let me tell you, this game is actually a ton of fun when you get into it. You start off as a naked survivor on a beach, that's nothing new. And then typically as a new player, you die, you know, 10 to 300 times before you figure out that you can pick berries for food, you can punch trees and pick up rocks to make tools. But after you figure that part out, you can focus more on leveling up, building shelter, and crafting new items. Once you start doing that, Ark really starts showing the depth of what it has to offer. Later on, you'll figure out that you can quit dying to the elements just by leveling up fortitude a few times, and that leveling up your melee damage also increases the amount of resources you get when you're hitting things with tools. And then right when you're about to off yourself because you're tired of picking berries, that's where the dinosaurs come in. Tame a trike, and boom, you'll never need berries again. And later on, when you're tired of getting killed by Carnos, just lure them back to your base where you have a bunch of X plants and auto turrets set up, and then watch them suffer. As of my last time playing, every animal in the game is tameable, and each one has its own utility. Some dinos are good for gathering berries, some are for meat, some literally just exist so you can force feed them, causing them to shit all over the place. I'm dead serious, that's the best way to make fertilizer. You feed this guy stem berries, you make him poop, and then you feed the poop to a dung beetle and wait a few minutes. It's glorious. I could honestly go on for hours about all the things you can do in this game. In addition to all the endless things you can do and creative ways to make traps or find transportation around the map, Ark also has a really cool group system called your tribe. When you add someone to your tribe, they now won't be shot by your turrets, they won't get attacked by your dinos, and they can access any doors you've built unless you restrict access to admins only. As a result, you've got to be careful about who you let in or you might get robbed blind while you're offline. But don't worry too much about that because if someone really pisses you off, you just remove them from the tribe while they're offline, drag their body outside to be eaten alive, or brutally murdered by your turrets as soon as they lock back in. Or if you're the sadistic type, you can take all their tools off their body and lock them in a cage. Then when they pass out from hunger, you just force feed them to keep them healthy, and yeah, you just keep them in the cage like a pet, you psychopaths. Another thing about the tribe system is, tribes can be huge. To my knowledge, I don't think there's a limit to how many people can be in your tribe. And if there is one, it's a very high limit. So this means that no matter how many people you want to play with, there's room for them. And anybody that has experience in the game, I know that you know that this can be problematic because there's huge tribes called alphas that will literally hog the entire server. But don't worry, if you really don't want to deal with PvP and other players, you can just play PvE online with your friends. Overall, Ark is absolutely bursting with content, and I can guarantee you will have fun if you stick with it for a while. And a side note, don't buy the new version Arc Survival Ascended. As of right now, it's terribly optimized, and I only get about 40 FPS running it on a 4070 Ti. Not to mention the old game has been out since 2015, so there's been a lot of work done to it, and it's pretty well-rounded. I was not prepared for the amount of fun I would have playing this game. I was simply looking for something fun to play with my girlfriend that didn't require any mods and had controller support when I came across this game with an insanely high positive review percentage on Steam. Loading in for the first time, you're a space traveler who crash lands on this planet due to an anomaly causing your ship to malfunction. I won't go too far into the premise or show any like secret spots so you can watch this without any true spoilers, but let's just say there's a ton of exploring to do. A massive problem I always have with exploration games is that you can explore these massive worlds but it doesn't really add anything interesting to the game. In the Planet Crafter, you're constantly finding new crafting materials, shipwrecks with new equipment, and areas that I'm not even sure are there for yet. My girlfriend and I have been playing this game for about a week, actually slightly less, and I'm sitting at about 28 hours in game. So yeah, we're addicted. Another great thing about this game is that there's a free demo, and it isn't one of those lame demos that holds your hand and mansplains everything to you. It just drops you in the map like normal, and then if you decide to buy the game, you just pick up where you left off in the demo. That sounds to me like a development team that's confident you're going to want to keep playing. And apparently they were right. Stepping out of your pod for the first time, the planet is just a giant dust ball. You start off a little confused about why the game looks so bleak and boring, but then you see the tips in the top left and you get to work. 
By the time you finish the tips, you kind of understand how the game works and it doesn't give you any more tips to clutter your screen. And eventually it becomes clear that the whole goal of the game is to terraform and create life on this planet to the point that it becomes inhabitable. Then after several hours, which will feel like minutes, the planet starts to change based on the things you do and the different levels of terraforming you reach. You'll eventually start finding larvae on the ground, building rockets to help boost the condition of the atmosphere, and creating more advanced equipment to further your productivity. Tired of walking? Don't worry, you can make a jetpack. Tired of going back inside for oxygen and water? Well, eventually you can breathe the atmosphere and drink from lakes. Remember that area I showed from the starting sequence? Here's the exact same area later on. Yeah, pretty cool. To add to the experience, the music is light and airy and filled with satisfying synths, making you feel even more detached from reality. Trust me, this game will blow your mind and it'll make you wonder how long ago the sun went down when you eventually remember to look out the window. Whoops. If ambience is what you're looking for, look no further than Subnautica. The one catch with Subnautica right off the bat is that it's a single player game, but don't worry, there's a pretty good mod called Nitrox that makes it multiplayer with minimal glitches. It's pretty easy to set up besides some finicky details during setup. The interesting thing about Subnautica is that it takes place almost entirely underwater. Similarly to Planet Crafter, you crash land on this planet because of an anomaly. I'm actually just now realizing this. But in this case, you get to play around on a water ball instead of a dust ball. Exciting, right? In Subnautica though, the experience can be slightly more cryptic because there are creatures everywhere, some of them are aggressive, and you aren't exactly sure why you're near this planet to begin with. There's no terraforming going on, so why are we messing around with this huge ball of water? I haven't played enough yet to find out personally. There are several other similarities to the Planet Crafter, but ultimately I think the game's charm really kicks in as you start trying to dive deeper and deeper into this alien ocean. As you craft better equipment and feel more invincible, you find out that the limit is even further than you previously thought. It took me years to listen to all the Subnautica hype, so don't make the same mistake I did by missing out for so long. If you haven't played it, just go get it. All right, so so far we've been a caveman, we've went to space, we've been on a dust planet, and we've been on a water planet. So I think the only thing missing is like an apocalypse? Well fortunately, Seven Days to Die is just that, a good old zombie apocalypse. The oldest game on this list in development since 2013, I'm sure you've heard plenty about it, but it's still very much worth talking about. I personally don't have a vast amount of knowledge on the history of the game and the capabilities within it, but I know enough to know that it's fun as hell. In fact, it really is kinda like hell. The whole premise is that every seventh day in game, a huge horde of zombies spawns, and your goal is to accumulate enough equipment and build a strong enough base to withstand it. By default, the days are one hour long in game, so there's plenty of playtime to get yourself fortified, but make sure you do or you'll get your ass handed to you. Also don't worry, after the first seven days the cycle repeats and I believe the horde gets more difficult each time. I would do some research to give you a little bit more details on the game, but I don't want spoilers the same way you probably don't. I mentioned in the intro that I'm not a huge fan of crafting games that are loot heavy, so you might wonder why I'm suggesting this and not rust? Well that's because seven days to die makes the looting process a lot more fun and intense. You may walk into a regular looking house and discover that the basement opens up into this underground network full of equipment and possibly boss zombies, maybe even zombie bears. Or you may go up to the attic to discover there's a lot more going on up there than you thought was possible. Not to mention while you're doing all of this looting, you may go outside to find that it's dark and now the zombies are running and there's crawlers that are horrifying. So yeah, it just makes things a lot more fun. And furthermore, the game still has plenty of resource gathering aspects. It's got a complex skill tree system and it's got some sandbox elements, such as digging, to keep the game interesting. If you're looking for a game that will keep you and your friends on edge, this is definitely the answer. I'd also like to mention that the game has made leaps and bounds in progress when it comes to graphics and performance. I mean, for example, just compare this old footage of mine from 2019 to now in July of 2024. It seems like time is of the essence in both the gameplay and the development of Seven Days to Die. So there you have it, four games that you can play with your friends without having to rage at hackers, without wanting to kill your friends because they made you derank, or simply without having to be on such a competitive edge all the time. And by the way, if you enjoyed this video, I've likely got content coming from all of the games in this list and more, so subscribe if you'd like to see any of that, and feel free to leave a comment letting me know your favorite moments from any of these games, or maybe even some suggestions for other people that watch this video for the same reason that you did. But no matter what you do, thanks for watching, and I hope this helped you out. I'll see you guys in the next one.